So uh, this conference was organized because we wanted really uh, to discuss this NGO um, communication and non-profit communication. So we decided to bring you here this afternoon and the presentation was composed by two parts. The first part I will talk about the other logic to non-profit communication which is also the, the subject of this conference. And then after, uh, Marcus Wiesenberg will present a model that we developed together with the model of four communication flows of NGO and churches legitimation. Uh, this morning we were very happy to see that Sara Balona has already applied uh, to empirical research, so we are not expecting, so that was very rewarding. Now we're going to have the opportunity that uh, Marcus will present you uh, the background uh, of the model and how we came to these uh, sushi, like we call it, it's like a sushi uh, roll. So I will start with a small, uh, a small movie um, that actually um, invites us to um, understand um, a bit what was the rise of uh, the NGOs. But before, I would like to talk. Um, I would like to talk about uh, the agenda for our presentation. So I will start by talking about the rise of nonprofit. We will concentrate on these media relations and fundraising. We'll speak about the other logic, referring to a model that was developed in 2011. And after, we will um, go into communication management and legitimation. And at the end, we will present the model of the four communication flows of NGO and churches legitimations. And we are happy to discuss with all of you uh, your insights and thoughts of this. So I would like to start, and we saw yesterday this picture on your presentation in color. I'm a bit more conservative, so I got a black and white version. And uh, uh, so everybody knows or has seen this uh, anti-slavery movement um, logo that say, I'm, a, I'm not a man and a brother. And actually, the um, anti-slavery movement was um, founded in 1839 by Thomas Clarkson, Thomas Fowell Buxton, and other abolitionists to the campaign against slavery worldwide. So we had a group of people that came together in that time and decided to create what we could say now a grassroots movement. So I was reading the, the, um, the daily reports of this group and they always mention it was very important that we get the, um, the ladies in Paris to use it as a kind of uh, decoration on their breasts. And with that, they were kind of putting in the, mes the messaging in the circles that had to take the decision for uh, abolished uh, slavery. So actually, we are seeing here the first state that we could compare also with other movements that are even before. Because we can see in Europe, also in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, there are saints that always uh, tell the story, and I hope I don't say anything wrong, uh, there are saints who always tell the story that they were giving bread to the poor, and after they closed uh, their, their breast, and when they opened those roses. And this is like a PR story of the function of the NGO within uh, monarchy level. So the king was taking care of the art, economic part, and the queen was already doing NGO work. And after that, they got a bit more organized, and they were printing in uh, some kind of a slogan and embedment of the messaging. And then, in the 50s, after the war, we saw this institutionalization of NGOs. And I would like to invite you to see a movie, a piece of a movie, Four Minutes, from Charlie Chaplin, who is actually talking, to the, in that time, to what we could consider the conditions to the rise of these kind of organizations. So, I, will, I have just to change the, the slide. I hope it works. It does. An emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls. 
has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men, with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. Only the unloved hate. The unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery. Fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man. Not one man, nor a group of men. But in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines. The power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful. To make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world. A decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! to see someone uh, that actually was always making comedy and uh, they were actually recording the movie and then he just came out with it. So, so it was planned to record something else but then this came out. So we talk here about uh, an historical piece that actually could be framed in this after war period when we see that the organization started uh, to, to rise and to become institutionalized, when actually the, 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 the concept of non-governmental organization was institutionalized. And after we see the race of groups that they were mentioned many times during this conference, and I would like to look at them now from a different perspective. One, the Amnesty International, uh, the British lawyer wrote an article in the Observer newspaper and launched a campaign that had an incredible response. What is this? Media relations only. So through the media, to the democratization of Europe, to the period of peace and economical growth, people were starting to read newspapers, the public sphere was being mediated and this mass mediation of the public sphere allowed these forms of uh, Con citizens' congregation to be organized in certain institutional forms. So here we have a good example of media relations. And if we look at Greenpeace, we have an example of a fundraising machine. Because if you look at the second paragraph, the money for the mission was raised with a concert. Their old fishing boat was called the Greenpeace. There, this is where our story begins. Our story begins. This is a statement from their website. 
So you see that before they start to campaign, they raise money, and then they could make the ship and make the trip. Uh, and I think this bold example illustrates what I would call this uh, NGO period that was uh, with this dichotomy of media relations and fundraising as the main activities related to communication. So now if you look, for example, at the growing, we see that exactly after Charlie Chaplin spoke, that we have the raise of the NGOs, and now we see also that the international government organizations are not growing anymore. So we see actually that the international and national, so the ego, egos uh, is governmental, NGOs is niche governmental, so you see that they are in the total, so you see that the NGOs are growing especially over the last 20 years. And this is a new reality, so we have, uh, the society is changing, we are not, not anymore in this paradigm of uh, um, a mediated system that is actually controlled and dominated by newspaper, by radio and by TV, so we need to think of something alternative. Because doing media relations for NGO is not enough. We saw this morning with the presentation, with the volunteer presentation for Antonia S, that really showed the potential of volunteer communication. And I cannot present the whole model because I'm still working on it, but I would like to share with you only two results that I have from the empirical study I have been performed in the last three years. And we looked at what other activities, rather than media relations, were the international human rights organizations doing. And we see here that actually communication with members on volunteers is less than 50%. So the communication team doesn't see that asks to communicate with, with members and volunteers. And after we see also that communication with recipients that are uh, the people that are helped by the NGO. So in case that you have an operative NGO that is on, in place, then you have these recipients. And also to do marketing and fundraising and communication with politicians is even less. So we see that we still have in 2050, this is really fresh data from last week, uh, that uh, the communication with outside and media relations are dominating the activities of the communication team. But then you could argue, okay, but that's because they have one team for media communication but they have another team for, for fundraising and they are not actually uh, cooperating with each other, which means they are not doing integrated communication. And that's true, because if you ask them uh, who is involved in fundraising, you can divide here the strategic and operational, and PR and communication, they are not very involved. And these are like significant values, which means that the consistency of the data was a normal distribution. So we can take it, despite a low number, over 47, because it's international NGOs, we can also take the data as a tendency, with more or less 10% uh, error margin. So which means that in terms of strategy, only between zero and 20% of the NGOs are the, have this collaborating between PR and communication. And how that comes, we could ask. It's very easy, because if we remember, and I mentioned already this morning in the discussion, uh, in the 70s, the social marketing was coming, and with it also what we call direct marketing. We uh, criticized a lot of times in NGOs, they, which means they made what we call high velocity premiums mailing in order to take money out of people. And that is good because it's of a good cause, but on the other side, it's split. It's guys and a big inconsistency of the way we are dealing with communication. Because when on one time PR that is doing media relation and actually talking about the subject, but on the other side we have the money machine. Like we saw there by Greenpeace. They are not together. Why not? So we see here that we have a dichotomic communication approach. Media relations and fundraising on one side. And now I would raise two, I would uh, add two more that actually are not taking us in the good direction. One is the mass messaging, and the other is the digital communication. And why? Because the mass messaging is, as is uh, portrayed on this report from WWF, Weathercox and signposts show that the discourse and the conversation is becoming very poor because they want to raise engagement. They want to mobilize people. And mobilization is only the first step of the communication process. I cannot, I can shout and make here some show in one minute to get your attention, but I cannot explain you what I have to say if I'm not conducting a communication act, if I'm not in exchanging symbolic concepts. 
So that's why the movement, this was the conclusion of this, uh, this report was made by a scientist from the UK, that actually the, there was the messaging was becoming very poor. And now we have another challenge. We have the digital communication that even enforces more. So we have this, uh, I like it, I share it, thousand messages coming day by day, and this is another challenging. So this is really demanding for an, um, an alternative approach. If we see, we can see a strong focus on media relation, fundraising, used marketing and direct marketing tools, so it's not integrated. Uh, there is no integrated strategic communication that was performed on a case study based by Amnesty Greenpeace and another local NGO that I developed uh, in 2011. And we see also the mass messaging and the digital communication challenges. And besides, we also see that society is changing, which means we have the old NGOs and we have what I would call the rising NGOs. Or maybe they are not NGOs. Well, let's not get there in that discussion in this, uh, in this time, maybe next time. Now let's concentrate, for example, of Avas. Avas, World in Action, founded in 2007, 41 million people in less than eight years. Members in 194 countries. Wow, amazing. What they do? They have an emailing list where they invite people to participate in online petitions and they collaborate with other NGOs and they claim to be the efficient NGO in the world. But we also see that sometimes they kind of see the issues that the public wants to address and consider it actually as a positive factor. And I would say, well, if we give only the public what they want to see, then we end up what we see in the commercial television. So we have to be very careful. And this is a threat to the NGO movement and also to the, what I would call the more NGO driven organization versus non-profit organizations. I make there a distinction. We don't have time uh, to go there now. Um, and we have this social reality. But also we have on the other side something very interesting because we are very dominated And they were explaining me that they had an organization called Galak Kalinga. And Galak Kalinga actually is, uh, means in English give care. And they are a Philippine based movement that aims to end poverty by first restoring the dignity of the poor. And why are they different? Because they don't accept, for example, money from corporations if they don't compromise to take care of the family for a long time. So they can contribute, but they have to take care. They have to take responsibility. The workers of the company had to go there. So there has to be this human component, component in the NGO and not the separation through this engagement. On the other side, they, uh, they, they write, this is also from their website, it employs an integrated and holistic approach to empowerment with values formation and leadership development at its core. And they saved already, I think, more than, uh, than uh, one million, and they have 2,000 communities. They were established in 2003, so very recent as well. And this is another example from what I will be talking about in the model I will introduce soon. We, is like, we have uh, examples for this uh, digitalization, but we have on the other side also very good examples uh, raising up. Maybe they are not here in Europe because we have a different setting, but they are on the other side of the world. So we need to check where things are happening and not really be looking at our, um, at our structures that we have here in Europe and, pretend, and, and believe that they are or they could be any better than the other just because we have uh, other systems and other development or other level of, uh, um, of wealth. So in that sense, I would like to invite you now to take a quick uh, look at this framing model for NGO communication and public sphere communication strategies that was developed, like I say, in 2011. And I consider here uh, the perspective that the market can be divided into monetary and non-monetary markets. So we have markets which make with the money, with the commercial marketing. We have no market with like the, it's still money involved, but there is not there is not a marketplace. And there I would put the NGOs in this level and the non-profit. And we have the other one with the non-monetary economy. 
that is made by citizens because when I am working for uh, 15 hours was there the, the average right 15 hours per month a, vo a German volunteer was engaged I am giving my resource but not in the form of money so there is no monetary and if we decline these levels into these agents citizens consumers politics and government so the political power and companies and economic et the entities the economical power and mirror in through two sides in two paradigms we can have a new holistic vision of what NGO communication could be about we are not talking about communication management yet we're just talking about communication so we have on one side the concept of the homo economicus and the other side the concept of the homo reciprocans you can already read it uh, from the Latin words one is based on uh, make uh, a profit and the other is based on cooperation or reciprocity and actually the NGO sometimes are a bit schizophrenic because they have on this side the, the fundraising department and here they have the communication department or they have the campaign department here that the mass media uh, relations team is acting there so I'm like okay we have to choose are we good are we bad are we instrumentalist are we not and I'm arguing you don't need to choose you just need to consider the reality because on one side one side you have the homo reciprocans that means that the citizen consum consumer is uh, looking at the public interest, at the reciprocity. And then if you go one down, you have the democratic and society development as the main goal of the politics and governments. And the same in terms of companies and the economic entities, you have the social responsibility that is still there. But on the other side, you have the homo economicus model. Individualism, my own profit, power and vote, as the goal uh, to a, a campaign for politics or to a government to keep them in the power and companies and economic entities profit and grow. So do we have to choose between those two paradigms? Do we have to be the good or the bad? No. We can just consider as possibilities to understand communication management, uh, to communication, uh, pardon, communication NGOs and we can see at different strategies and actually when fundraising is coming together with media relations, is coming together with engagement, we can look at it from an uh, auto-communication perspective and from there we can start to think about doing communication management and not only press, re uh, press relations. So I would now, uh, and this of course is looking pretty much of the individuals, of the people, because if you see a volunteer, it's someone, uh, an individual that is on And if we have that in a, big, in a big picture, then we can actually go a bit further, I would say. So in terms of specificities of communication management, we can talk about the organizational form that rise from a public interest, that is neither a management approach, nor a normative approach, or even an organizational cultural variable. We talk here about what I would say, oh, this uh, jumping what I would say the ontological must, which means they were built by citizens and that is the condition where they start. So they are driven from the democratic legitimacy. If we, we remember the Charles Chaplin speech, he was talking the democracy, the end of dictatorship. The democratic legitimacy was the soci sociological principle in which those organizations were talked into existence. Because like uh, Lars Tocher Christensen said yesterday, I cannot talk hello Greenpeace, how are you? No, Greenpeace are volunteers, they are members, they are workers. The same with the Catholic Church, the same with other churches. So we have this, the, the, the existence of the organization, organizations are communication, they are talked into existence through 
the coming together from the citizens. And also this includes a public interest perspective and a democratic structure. We cannot uh, speak much about NGOs in a non-democratic structure because uh, the democratic structure is giving the decision, the participation, the capacity for the people to engage and to make actually an organizational form. And it's in that point that actually we met, uh, I say, uh, Marcus Wiesenberg and myself working, he works in churches, I work in NGOs, and we got more or less the same conclusions and decided to work on a model that is going to present um, um, in the next minutes that actually tied to, to, to look at, uh, at some questions. Before that questions, I would like to leave you another short movie. And this short movie is from Thailand and actually is a, an advertisement campaign. But I found it as a very good example because I would say that if we look, if we don't try to produce reality, but if we try to understand the social constructed reality, we can analyze a movie as a piece of communication, as a product, a social construct of a society, as we can see advertisement uh, on the same way. So maybe we can look at this very well and emotional, I, pre I prepare a Thai piece of advertisement that actually brings what I would say that is the ontological principle of the NGO communication. I mean, of course, this is a commercial, and, uh, um, but uh, still I found that it packaged very well what I'm trying here to say uh, through some uh, academical models that actually we need. And I, I was reading uh, recently 
that uh, one of the, the, the most uh, um, needed uh, stuff in, in Germany, for example, is, uh, is engagement, real engagement, because people are getting a lot disconnected to each other. And uh, actually, I think there is the possibility for the NGOs, because people want to do stuff. Some of them are not religious, maybe on religious stuff, uh, Marcus is the specialist, but now talking for the NGOs, I'm not religious, but still, I have this, uh, this, uh, this need to help others to be connected, uh, to develop things. So I think when NGOs, and now coming back to the concept of the auto-communication, when NGOs are able to take into their organizations the people and make processes for communication, and communication is organization, then we have a new approach that can make the NGOs be more consistent in Western Europe and not only a huge massification of followers or of people who are engaging online, but doesn't translate in the offline world. And I think we have very good examples, for example, in, in India, where all the companies are obliged to give 2% on corporate social responsibility, and the NGOs can just go there and reclaim. So they are creating these ties on that uh, part that I spoke from these Omar reciprocal principles. So now coming back to more academic and, uh, and um, conceptual work. So in the model for uh, um, the four flows, we look at uh, who legitimate organizations that represent and act in the public interest? How do NGOs and churches acquire and defend legitimacy through communication? And what are the management process limitation of such communication? And for that, Marcus Wiesenberg will present this part of the work we have done. Yeah, thank you very, very much to Ivandro Oliveira. And this is really something we came together here in Leipzig after finishing our work, Ivandro, in his master thesis in NGOs, and I did my master thesis in uh, churches and evangelical churches. And we're looking back and found out, okay, all this, especially, you can say, models which we have in strategic communication and most, mostly in, in communication management are based on economics models, which means from enterprises, and then they come in, and then NGOs, churches, try to adopt these models to their, to their NGO, to their churches, and found out that, what are we doing though? So it does not really function. And there was a start point also for us, discussing these topics, going deeper in these topics, and we ended up by legitimation, which is, um, first I, I will just give you a short introduction of what we mean with legitimacy, with the, with the term. So for us it is a generalized perception or assumption that the action of an entity are desirable, proper, or you can say appropriate within some social constructed system of norms, values, beliefs, and definitions. So we can also saw this, can also call this of institutions. So within institutions, these are appropriate actions you can you do. So for asking, it was for us important to look. Okay, what is what is different? We had looked on um, first. We looked on joint stock companies and found out. Okay, who's look. Uh, legitimizing joint stock companies and found out most of them, of course, the investors are one important legitimation source for these joint stock companies. And as Evandro already told, the governments, are, and, and especially governments are in, in democratic um, field, in, in democratic institutions and uh, systems, are legitimated by, by elections, by voters. And then we looked around this and, and found out, ah, okay, there is much more. We looked in, dive deeper into political uh, parties and, and uh, found that uh, Donges, for example, already uh, mentioned that political parties got their legitimation by, got legitimation by their uh, members. And there was something we thought, yes, here we can start in, and maybe this is something yeah, we have to bite in and we have to look forward. So, 
And what we then recognized in what is the legitimation sources and flows of NGOs and churches. So let me just give you some <laughs> ideas about what we mean with NGOs and churches to just uh, make this clear. So with NG NGOs in, and churches, you can say in differentiation between, between non-profit organization at all, they are not looking mainly on the interest of their members. Like every nonprofit is looking on the interests of the members, but NGOs and churches are looking beyond these interests. They are looking, they are public interests, and so this is a very important uh, differentiation we did. So, and then, just to give you the definition of NGOs, they are formalized, stable, long term groups of persons who work in the public sphere, but without an official mandate. So, the connection between NGOs and GOs. For the interests of non-members whose members' life lengths differ from the lifetime of those organizations. So, you have one than more, one, one than, more than one life. That is important. And for churches, um, of course, we, we separate them by the old idea from, came from Weber and Trold in the, in the uh, 19th century. Um, differentiate between church and sects. So church are religious organizations that accept the social environment in which they exist, so they are open for their environment. Sects are closed for their environment, so they uh, don't want to have contact with their environment. And so there are low barriers of entry. Most of the um, members are born members by baptism as child, and they are integrated in an autonomous subsystem which called religion with a functionally differentiation social environment. And what is also important to bring this together again with the NGOs, it is they are both intermediate mediating functions between subsystems and between micro and macro levels. What does it mean with this? So you have mostly what, what you Ivandro already told, uh, finally, is that individuals become, in, in, for example, in Germany, have no connection with the macro, subs, with the macro systems, macro institutions, and got lost. So, and there, already in, in 1995, um, it was Lukman and it was also Berger who introduced the idea, stems from Galen, of, uh, of something like intermediate institutions or intermediate organizations, which are between these overall uh, macro systems and the micro system, which is the, the people and the individuals, to bring them together and to bring the public interest, their interest, to give them more voices to the, to the um, over macro institutions. So, having said this, we looked on the, uh, we had the questions, what is about communication management and what is the main goal of communication uh, management? And the main goal of communication management and public relations is um, the license to operate, how we call that. So that is in the center. And Holzhausen and Serfas define strategic communication as the practice and practice of deliberate and purpose of communication, a communication agent enacts in the public sphere on behalf of a communicative entity to reach set goals. That is the definition we have heard yesterday and uh, today also. But what we found out, this is just a heavenly functionalistic perspective of communication, bringing this into something like a normative way and was questioned by us and thought, how does it work? How does this idea work, like integrated communication to NGOs? And we heard also with Antonia Hess to, in the morning that it's not the way integrated communication works in NGOs and in churches also. We found out that a local, uh, if you come to the local point, they're doing a lot of other stuff than, than, the, than the bishops or whatever tell. So there's a huge gap. And 
what we try to do is to focusing the, on the public sphere, uh, what, what mainly uh, this, this idea of strategic communication, communication management does is focusing on the public sphere as an external communication approach. And so we wanted to bring in the a much more social, cultural context, which leads to a permanent co-creation of the organization, which is very important. And if we then take that together, strategic communication must integrate the involvement of members as their communicative action in the public sphere. So, therefore, we have to understand that communicative actions are always limited, of course, and as this management too. So, to bring that in, unpaid members are what we call also nuclear ambassadors, and they are multipliers in the environment. And so, for us, it's very important, like Evandro also told, that the organization is just created by, also by its, uh, by its members. So, and to bringing all this together, we just found a, or we just made a, a approach in the concept, which is mostly based on, of course, the public sphere, we already told you, and uh, the idea of structuration of, by Giddens. And we brought this together with the idea of collective action theory, which stems from Scholl, and uh, which is also very known by Olson, we come up with the idea of free rider. So, and we want to give you some insights now of the four communication flow of NGOs and churches in this framework, so we developed and we now, I would like to present you. So there's one, the first flow, which is, we call uh, the internal legitimation. I already give you the uh, ideas behind this, so, that is very important to look that all the time the members of churches and NGOs giving, uh, legitimizing their organization. Although I have to say churches and church leaders invoke a divine charisma, which is called by Weber, this alone is no longer in, in the society, is no longer enough to represent a membership organization in the public sphere. This is what we have to bear in mind. So our second flow, now it comes a little bit more, I would say, practical, um, is the introduction, which comes from the management and the core stuff. And here, this is what we call, you can see, is a campaign, for example, which is started by the management, and they involving the members communicate in the public sphere and therefore they are legitimizing again their, uh, their organization of course and others so they bind in other population and this is of course very you can say the normative idea and very functionalistic yes I would say of course this is then we found out there's another one even of because they are these volunteers, these members, unpaid members, are part of the organization, they are going out and just telling their ideas and promoting their organization on the one hand and through this legitimizing them. But on the other hand, they can also destroy the organization. So for example, if you take the Catholic Church, it is not only all people are saying, oh, and the members are not saying, and groups are not saying, oh, yeah, the Catholic Church, and I like them. No, you, you can also listen to critical voices which say, I want change. And this is very important. If you take also this into consideration for NGOs, it is the same. So members are activate, activating in the public sphere, sometimes with a special uh, idea and as we come from management and sometimes even on their own and sometimes in organized groups and this is a very important point which we think, which we call the um, 
inside out momentum. So and then there was another one we found out. It is our third flow. We call that from the outside inside out. This is what you also heard from it looks like a sushi roll, isn't it? <laughs> so this is what you what yesterday uh we were told by the idea of auto communication. It is it is quite funny because we we did this without knowing <laughs> of auto communication. And as after the last uh, last year we got the information, oh yes, it looks like auto communication. So of course members are this is this is tricky because there are also two. I think we should maybe we should add some more. Uh, because on the one hand we have members are listening in the public sphere about oh okay there is some some threat for the organization. And then they bring this into the stuff and the stuff can react. The management can react in the communication way and change the strategic communication. For example. But then there's the idea, but when we really think of the outer communication idea, think it more. So the management communicates and this really challenges the organization as a whole and its members the whole time. And then they come up and bring, what are you communicating about, about me uh, as a member? So, and, and totally confused and then maybe they got lost. Because only if the campaign makes the follow of, of him or whatever. So this is kind of outer communication I think we have also to, to bring in, which is another part. So yeah, this is the four flows we would like to present. The four is of course uh, the normal is say external legitimation, which is heavenly known, and I don't need to express them out. But yeah. We have some more discussions, questions, I think, for you, and we hope that some questions for, for, from, from you. Um, and we thank you very, very much for the, dis yeah, for the discussion which now follows. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus and uh, Evandro. So, uh, after this uh, wonderful and deep presentation on, on the four flows model, um, for sure we have at least four different questions, one for each flow. Uh, and I'd like the audience to come up and put them. Any questions? One? Any other question more? So let's start with this one. Um, can you go back to your flows, your flow model? To your sushi. <laughs> to your sushi <laughs> um, What do you think, which of these flows NGOs or churches have priority on? I mean, do you think they prioritize? What is the status quo in the practice? Yeah, we, we can do together. Maybe we, we do both parts. I mean, I would say that we are here not talking about communication strategy yet. So the communication strategy, the prioritization and the organizational setting is of course in defining the operative part. So here we are just trying to illustrate a way for us to understand on a conceptual level the four dynamics. Because till now the science is only looking at this. Like all the literature you can find is only talking about the four. That's why I went on the last place. Who is an organization is getting legitimation. This is normal. But what we didn't thought was, for example, this one and the other ones who are like the ones that actually match the structuration with the sure concept of collective action. And that uh, rounded the concept that actually the organization is talked into existence, out to all these dynamics. So to say what is priority, it depends. Maybe you need to concentrate on create processes from one, but maybe once you have done that, you don't have to care anymore about it because you have the structures. And before I give to Marcus to add something, I would like also to make here a division. We have communication that is controlled and communication that is not controlled, but still happened. I would not call it formal informal because I don't like the terms, but I would say, for example, here, the management has nothing to do with this. Like when I come and say, I am volunteer of amnesty, I am amnesty in this moment, what I say will be, 
taken into the consideration as amnesty, either if the management like or not. And I tell you more, if you look at the story of Greenpeace, there was one dissident. And there are lots of versions. He still is Greenpeace. He still is acting in the... So now he's here, he still is making his to be. And that is something that you don't have in the company. Because there is contracts, there are rules, there are formalized terms in which the memberships are negotiation. Looking at CCO perspective, the four flows also, other flows, uh, you have the membership negotiation. Here, the membership negotiation is not done. It's taken for granted by the condition of the citizens. Yeah. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that I think it also needs uh, to be balanced. That is quite, quite important to be to balancing the legitimation flows. Bring it into consideration from a management point of view. Like you told, it is important to also, because they are members and volunteers, free members, to don't, don't try to control them, but to equip them. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Another question uh, and another one. It's more sure. a mark, it's not a question. Um, I think that, uh, and I don't know about all the scientific uh, part of this, I'm from practical part of this, and I think NGOs uh, are aware that the members are ambassadors and they uh, try to give them the tools to communicate in, in, uh, in public. So um, maybe the Scholars were are not aware of it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. We could for our office uh, already theoretically. <laughs> yeah, but now a question for you, if I may break the rules. Yes, what would be the ones that you consider not to be very present in uh, the organ? What, which one or ones you would consider? Uh, I'm sorry, would consider not to be very present on your daily business? Since I'm working for an NGO, I'm from Doctors Without Borders. Um, uh, since there is not much criticism about that organization, thankfully, uh, it's the third one. Mm -hmm. um, it's a third one, okay. So when, for example, a doctor is on the... Uh, the doctors are paid or volunteers? They're volunteers. They're volunteers. Yes, so if uh, they are here. So if they go to the, to, the, to the place and they come in and say there is a okay. need, then we have the tree. I yeah. think you are making the two B. You are making the two B is like sorry. It's like you are meaning like uh, people are talking without being framed in the organization about the organization. Every every doctor who comes who goes to a project or come back to a project and there are not only doctors, there are many, many other people yes, who work yes. there. Um, they get a briefing, uh -huh. and a debriefing, not only from the um, also from my, from the communication department, they get briefed and they uh -huh. get debriefed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, there are media trainings and stuff like that. So That's two way. Every, every, every member. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, thank it's you great. Because the, you, you asked me for the, for the least important. Yes, yes. And I think that it's three. Three, okay. Okay, thank so thank you yeah. for this switch on, <laughs> this answering on. So it's really participatory. Thank you very much. <laughs> Another question here? <laughs> yep. Rather a comment. So I want to thank you for your work because it's so important. And um, we have a lot of, uh, because I come from the researcher's perspective, and I can say that we have a lot of work on internal crisis communication, for example. A lot of um, a big body of knowledge of internal communication in general. But um, when I researched the UNICEF crisis, for example, I didn't find anything that could explain to me the fact that when people were, were standing on the Christmas market, when the crisis was happening, um, for asking people to donate money for UNICEF, they were attacked <laughs> for, for having the UNICEF uh, little box, you know, little uh, box for donation. They were actually accused of being a part of UNICEF, of that part of big corporation um, with that alleged investment of donor funds. And I thought that was a, so, uh, such a problem, not just for UNICEF, but for uh, the people, for those innocent people <laughs> who were attacked at the Christmas market. They were ambassadors. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. they were, were in the face of the organization. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question here? No. Well, um, as you know, I've tried to put this in practice. 
Um, <laughs> and I strongly believe, uh, listening also to, to this uh, intervention, that I, I, I identify with, uh, with your point of view. But uh, what I feel is that this model, it's more applicable, as far as I'm uh, understanding it, on church contexts, uh, contexts and, and on institutions uh, other institutions uh, that are uh, dealing, uh, are operating in, on the third sector. Uh, because NGOs are the most organized institutions on the third sector. So that's why we have here some kind of contemporary Yes. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, uh, the case I have studied in Portugal, we have a, a diversity of uh, institutions working for the, the several causes that are not NGOs. Mm -hmm. It's uh, and they are uh, smaller. They don't have such uh, specialized um, professionals. Mm -hmm. They don't have communication departments, etc. Mm -hmm. So that uh, that model, I think, it's it's quite suitable for uh, their change. This pro this changing process. Mm -hmm. And that leads to my second uh, or, or first question. Because I, I have um, always this problem uh, with the definition. Uh, I always see the, the organizations born from movements and from societies, the third sector. There's uh, mm -hmm. some uh, controversy here because uh, uh, some school uh, applies it of uh, the non-profit sector, but I don't feel so comfortable. But I'm comfortable with the third sector. That is a, but for opposite to private sector yes, and yes, public yes, sector. Yes, yes. I, I feel comfortable yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. And do you understand my question? Yeah, Why yeah. you always, yeah. because it, you're not the only one, yeah. it's an NGO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for instance, Edelman Trust for Media also qualify institutions mm -hmm. like media, government, yeah. NGO. Yeah. Maybe we, 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 we will, we will ask. Word, I think yeah. I think we will ask from from uh, give you give you some answers. I can I will give you some answer from from the church perspective, like I know. Uh, that, yeah. So if we looking on. I wouldn't say that churches, as institutions, are not at all non-profit organizations. So churches have a religious background. And therefore, they are religious organizations at first. And out of this, they build up agencies which are called non-profit organizations and then NGOs and so forth. This is my answer. Yeah, yeah well, it would be the same because the difference is that you can have a non-profit, for example, uh, associations, they look at the interests of their own members. And here we have this dimension from a theoretical perspective that we needed to first design a conceptual model, second, a conceptual model that was looking at legitimization and the dynamics, and third, we need to define our object of study. And the definition of uh, these kind of organizations is not consensual. So we decide from a methodological perspective to concentrate on NGOs and churches as example, but of course, uh, and we didn't, uh, yeah, we didn't have time to mention it here, but we already think that it can be applied for companies. Yeah. And we related with a new publication from Serfas and Franca, 2014, that is talking about these internal um, it's called agencies. And, and especially if you go for, step forward, they are already doing is because they call it membership enablement yeah. so it is it is still very in, in practice also so okay thank you very much i think we could go on and on and on on this subject <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately we cannot so thank you very much evander and marcus for your wonderful thank you very much thank you thank you